Uh, We've worked our way through these verses from Colossians 3 verse 1 and uh, this is the next instalment. Colossians 3 verses 12 to 17. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ, to which you are also called in one body, rule your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns and spiritual songs singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, Before we begin, uh, let me tell you that one of the benefits of sitting by a campfire down on the south coast is that you come up with new sermon outlines and other Bible readings. So please forgive me, but we've got a new sermon outline that should come up now, uh, and that's replacing the one you've got there. Zechariah 3 was the new reading. Can I say, I was never aware of the link between Zechariah 3 and this passage until we read it in our kids' Bible. Uh, Let me encourage you to get a good kids' Bible, because it will actually open up the rest of God's Word for you. Uh, I'd never seen the connection between the clothes and the putting off and putting on that we see in Zechariah 3 that... Paul picks up in Colossians. Uh, So there's a new outline. Uh, I'll work my way through that outline. We'll leave that up during the sermon. And then, God willing, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. The sermons are recorded. Uh, You can watch them online or listen to them later on in the week if you don't get everything today. Uh, We're spending January reminding ourselves of the good life, how good it is to be one of God's people. Uh, In the first sermon, we saw the goodness of having our lives hidden with Christ. In Christ, we are forgiven our sins and we're given all of Jesus' perfection. We receive this by trusting in what Jesus has said and done, who he is. The Bible calls that justification. Uh, Last week, as Phil jumped into the next section, we saw the goodness of battling sin. Phil gave us a definition of the good life. It's to grasp hold of Jesus and be changed in him and by him. And it's the goodness of having all of Jesus' perfection and having a great dirty clothes basket to put off. This week, we want to explore that idea a little more, but see how it looks like as a community, as a mob, as a whole bunch of individuals who are putting off and putting on together as one community. Let me pray. We're going to look at it together. Our Father, thanks for your word. Uh, there's a, a famous phrase that says, uh, your word is like a pool in which an infant can paddle and an elephant can swim. Our Father, there is great simplicity but amazing depth. Uh, just like you are yourself, uh, a great simplicity, one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, who loves his creation, who judges sin, who saves sinners. Father, that is also deeply complex. How can you love people who hate you? How can you transform people who are so stubborn? How can you welcome people who turn their backs on you? Father, we pray that today we'll paddle like infants and dive like elephants and please transform us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, at point two on the outline, in these last three weeks, we've focused on the start of Colossians 3. I remember Colossians was a letter we did with Neil Hunt back in 2020, written by Paul and Timothy to God's mob in a small town called Colossae. We've been reminded each week that the heart of Colossians is transferred and transformed. Transferred from the dominion of darkness by God through his son. Transformed to live with our lives hidden in Jesus. And that transformation is really dug into from chapter 3 on. 
Uh, it's described in a number of ways. Uh, it, your life is hidden with Christ. You have put off the old man with his practices and have put on the new man who is being renewed. That's from the last two weeks. It's described here in verse 12. Look at verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved. Did you hear that description of who you are? We are God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved. Well, actually, there's another little word there, isn't there? It's a very small word, but we miss it. In fact, I missed it in my first copy of this sermon. I just didn't even notice this word. As God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved. I think that is such a helpful and wonderful description, especially that little word, as, to help us wrap our minds and hearts around some of the key conundrums and battles we face as God's people. I just want to walk through it step by step now and then unpack some consequences before I actually go in to look at the rest of the passage. Uh, First, that little word as. And you notice the tense of the word love? It's past, isn't it? Loved. As loved. All these things have already happened to you. You are already someone who is holy and dearly loved by God, if your life is hidden with Jesus. This is a description of our identity now. Uh, In the first sermon, it was described as already being raised with Christ, as having our lives hidden in Christ now, as people have been transferred now into God's kingdom. This is the description we heard last week of, you've already put on the new man. You're the new you. No makeover needed. No 12-step program. No series of rules and regulations. Not even a New Year's resolution. As someone who is already loved. That's who you are now. Second, that identity is achieved for us by whom? Do you notice it there? God. You're God's people. God's chosen people. I'm never going to get the image out of my mind as a bunch of bananas in front of me. God acted, God intervened, God initiated, God brought us to himself. God had a grievance against us and then came to find us. Didn't wait for us to come and find him. God gave us something. That was described earlier as God rescuing us, God reconciling us, God moving us. That's chapter 1, by the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. Third, this identity is described as... Holy and dearly loved. It is such a lovely description, isn't it? To be holy is to be unique. To be fit and right for God and his plans. To be loved, well, we all want to be loved, don't we? (laughs) But it's to describe us as the object of the supreme affection of God. God has affections. And he showers his love on us. Now, that's who we are as God's people today. Fourth, the as is not just a reminder of who we are. It then serves as a foundation for how we are to live. If you like, you could replace it with because. Because this is who you already are, dot, dot, dot. Now, how might you describe that in simpler terms? Uh, Let me give you a phrase. Live as you already are. Live as you already are. The foundation for our good lives as God's people is not how tightly we hold on to Jesus. It's not how diligently we read our Bibles. It's not how regularly we follow in Jesus' footsteps. The foundation for our good lives as God's people is the truth that God has already made you perfect in Jesus. That's the foundation for our good life. In Jesus, God has forgiven every one of your sins, past, present and future. In Jesus, God has given you all of his perfect life. 
the foundation for our good lives as God's people is the as. You're already hidden in Jesus. So go and live like it. Go and live as you already are. Part of that was described last week in the command of putting off, wasn't it? Uh, And Phil gave you a way of dealing with sin, an encouragement to deal with sin, a a recognition that we battle with sin. And we're going to pick up some of that a little later on in this sermon. God has already made you a new person, so go and spend the rest of your life getting used to it, living as you already are. Now, before we jump into looking at that putting on, let me just step through some of the consequences of unpacking that little description as God's chosen, holy and dearly loved. Let me, let me just unpack some consequences. The first consequence concerns a word that we often use as Christians. It's the word sanctification. You'll see it up there. Are we like big words? Colin even makes a song out of big words that end in shun. But it's helpful to actually unpack them a little more closely. Sanctification means to make holy, to make holy. In light of what we've just seen in verse 12, there's actually a lot more in that word than we recognise often, isn't there? You see, on the one hand, we're already holy, aren't we? (laughs) As. So you are completely holy now if your life is hidden in Jesus. You have a whole new you. It has already happened. Sanctification is complete. Uh, On the other hand, we've got to get used to it, don't we? We've got to get used to this new kingdom we live in. We've got to get used to this new boss when it's not me sitting on God's throne. And we've got to get used to it in everyday life. So sanctification is both a one-off event and something that happens every day. It's one off because you have everything that Jesus achieved in his life. It's continual because you spend the rest of your life getting used to it. You have positional, let's use some technical terms, you have positional sanctification. You are now closer to God than you ever could possibly hope to be. You can walk into the throne room of God and look him in the eye. Hebrews chapter 10. And you're going to spend the rest of your life getting used to it. It's progressive. Live as you are. The second consequence of this concerns our response to what God has done. Uh, I've heard a phrase over my time. You might have heard this phrase. They are so heavenly minded that they're of no earthly use. Uh, It's the accusation that if we fix our minds on things above, we actually separate ourselves from the real world. Well, let me tell you, that's a load of rubbish. That phrase is false. Did you notice that as soon as Paul and Timothy say, fix your minds on things above, what do they do in the verse 5 you looked at last week? (laughs) They focus on all those grubby things I do every day in the dust of the real world. My anger, my lust, my greed, my evil desires, my slander, my malice, my filthy language and jokes. To fix your minds on things above is to live daily in the dust of the real world. And that little phrase, as, and the therefore in verse 5, reminds us that the identity God has given us will now be expressed in those daily and small decisions expressing who God has made me. The third consequence is we now have some clarity about the struggle we face every day. Have you ever been exhausted by the fact that you've woken up and you've gone, I don't seem to have beaten sin at all? Has that battle ever worn you down so much that you doubt the goodness of what God has offered? (laughs) Have you ever gotten to the end of one year, let alone one day, and gone, hmm, I just gave in a sin all year? That's the reality of our lives, isn't it? We need to recognise that. Because we spend our whole lives getting used to what God has already made us. God knows we're going to battle. 
That's why he talks about it. That's why he reassures us that our security is already set. So get on and battle away. Struggle away. And we'll come to how that looks in a moment. But think about our world. A refugee family moves to a new country. It'll take them two to three generations just to work out what their citizenship looks like. We've been moved from hell to heaven. We're going to spend the rest of our lives trying to understand what that looks like. God has already made us this. We are dearly loved by him. He's granted us a new you. We're being renewed in his image. Colossians 3 verse 10. And we now express that in daily tough decisions. And the outcome will be good. Fourth consequence, I'm nearly there before we actually get to the passage. (laughs) The fourth consequence is that there is an end point to all this sanctification stuff. It's not just positional. It's not just progressive. Do you notice there at the end of verse 4 what will happen to you? You'll be perfect one day. Have you ever thought about that? You will be perfect one day. On that day when Jesus comes back, the positional sanctification and the progressive decisions we've made every day will come to an amazing climax where there will be, shock horror, the perfect Bernard Gavin. Completely and utterly acceptable to God in every part of his identity. That's perfect sanctification. And the heart of it all is there in verse 13. Look there in verse 13. Do you see what happens there right at the end? Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. You see, the engine for all of this is God's grace. Left to my own desires, my own schemes, my own methods, what am I? I'm in the domain of darkness. Receiving God's forgiveness, his gift that I don't deserve, that I don't earn, that I don't buy, I don't inherit, I'm completely transformed. I I suppose that's why it takes the rest of our lives because we actually need to understand grace, the free gift of God, him doing everything for us. In fact, that becomes the engine of the community. I'm up to point three on the outline. Come back and I'll read all of verses 12 to 14. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving one another, if anyone has a grievance against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. You had a command last week. We've touched on it. Phil talked about it. Put off. Put off. Uh, As Phil pointed out, the things that are to be put off are sins that are all relational, all self-centered, all focused on me because I'm God and God's not. But now we are to put on. Now we are to put on. Uh, It's a command. It's not optional. And it involves active decision-making. All of these commands in this little section are about us. And if you look closely at those attributes there in verses 12 to 14, they're all things where individuals do them for other people. (laughs) You can't be kind if you live on your own. Kindness is expressed to someone else, isn't it? You can't be patient if you live on your own. You can't forbear with other people if you live on your own. Now, that's a figure, but it's helping us understand that as a community, these are the attributes we are to express. They're relational. They're other person-centered. They serve to build the community of individuals who all have their lives hidden with Christ. And it's a community defined by grace. Remember verse 13? Look at it again. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. It's a community that forgives. Do you notice the way in which the forgiveness is expressed there? If you've got a grievance, you go and sort it out. Don't wait for the person who's offended you to come to you. Did you notice that? That's how God does it. That's exactly what God does in Jesus. God doesn't wait for us to come to him, does he? He comes to us, just like he did in the Garden of Eden, just like he did with Abraham, just like he did with David, just like he did in Jesus. And so that's how our community is to express forgiveness. It's a community that does not exclude 
but welcomes anyone to meet Jesus. It's a community that is inclusive but transformative. Come and meet Jesus, you'll never be the same again. It's a community that is active. It's a community that takes initiative. It's a community that's proactive, not reactive. That's how God is with us, isn't it? God isn't reactive. God's proactive. God takes the initiative. It's a community bound by a love that focuses on others. It's a community that walks sanctification together. We are plotting arm in arm, battling arm in arm, rebuking and hugging and accounting and forgiving. It's a community defined by grace. Now, let me tell you, no other community in the world's like it. Some of the world's communities are exclusive. They exclude people based on what sport they play or their skin colour. That's not God's community. Other communities in the world are so inclusive that they tie themselves in knots trying to work out how to be tolerant. Not God's community. We just look at Jesus, who welcomes anyone who comes to him in grace. Other communities are so tolerant, they become intolerant, forgetting how to forgive. <laughs> seen a bit of that this week. Not God's community, which is established by forgiveness undeserved. Other communities are non-communities. I'm too busy. I don't care. Not God's community, where the command is to actively participate and encourage and forgive. Do you reckon that's a good community? A community of sanctification, driven by grace? Well, let's look at the attributes very quickly before I close. Because every community has attributes. They're there in verses 15 to 17. Every community has things about them. Uh, Let the peace of Christ, to which you are also called in one body, rule your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Uh, this is a really striking section. I only discovered this at 10 o'clock last night. Uh, but there's four attributes here. Two of them are commanded to exist, whether you like it or not. And two of them are a response. Uh, The first of the two attributes that are commanded to exist uh, is in verse 15. The peace of Christ. It rules your hearts when God's community exists. The peace of Christ. The complete restoration of human beings by what Jesus has done must rule the hearts of God's community. It's non-negotiable. God commands the peace to be there. Which means when we look at each other, we actually look at each other as perfect people in Jesus. Which means we're kind and merciful and generous. Which leads to the next attribute, which is one we're to express in verse 15. What are we to be? Be thankful. That's our default mechanism. Having received all of God's forgiveness, all of Jesus' perfection, what are we? A thankful mob, not a whining, complaining, discontented, where are my rights kind of mob. We're a thankful mob, gracious and generous and gentle, which leads to the next attribute that must exist, that's commanded to be there, verse 16, the word of God dwells richly amongst God's people as they teach and admonish and sing with all wisdom. That's the partner to peace. Knowing that we're getting used to being remade in God's image, God gives us his word, not not as a rule book, not as a how-to book, not as instruction, but a revelation of his nature. Colossians 3.10. And so as that word of God dwells richly amongst God's people, it dwells not because it's beautiful, but because through it we walk together in sanctification, which leads to the final attribute in verse 17. What is it? Everything we do represents God. Every decision, every expression of this community, sanctified, represents Jesus. So how am I going to wrap that up in some simple applications for tomorrow morning? Hmm. It's pretty big, isn't it? 
Uh, I want to close with some statements that I want you to think about. Here are some statements. The goodness of this community is in the grace that includes anyone and everyone. That's the heart of sanctification. Statement two. The goodness of this community is in its transformation. Created by God to express the transformation that comes by his grace. It's not a membership. It's not a right. It's a participation together in living as we already are. It'll include everyone, but it will change everyone. The goodness of this community is expressed in kindness, forbearance and forgiveness. The goodness of this community is stated in the attributes of the peace of Christ and the rich dwelling of the word of God. The goodness of this community is its non-negotiable participation. If your life is hidden with Christ, if you're holy and dearly loved by God, you've got to be active in the moment. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the goodness of your community. Thank you for the goodness you have made in us. Thank you for the goodness of Jesus Christ. As you have already made us, help us to live as we are in this community. In Jesus' name, amen. Any quick questions? Baxter. Um, you said So Baxter's asked a good question. We're meant to be a thankful people, not a whinging people. So how do we express that in our prayers? A uh, really simple way to do it is to think of a way to pray that follows the way Jesus teaches us to pray. So how does Jesus teach us to pray in Matthew 6? In fact, we're about to use it. It begins with what? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So we adore God. We confess our sins. We're thankful for everything that he's given to us and then we come to him in request. And it's a request and we can present our concerns to God. There are whole psalms about that. They're called psalms of lament. God, the world's broken. Can you please do something about it? That's not a whinge. That's a lament. A whinge is where I'm on the seat where God should be and then I tell God, why didn't you do this for me? That's a whinge. Does that make sense? Good question, mate. Any other questions? Warwick. <laughs> I can make anything long. <laughs> yep. Yep. What Warwick wants to know what to do with verses that describe God's community as loving and where the world takes it out of context and says, well, why don't you do X, Y, Z? Is that, is that a fair summary of your question? Uh, I reckon it's really important to understand what God's love looks like. So 1 John 4 verses 9 to 10. Uh, you loved us first, and you express love in which way? By sending your son to live, die, and rise for our sins so that we could be changed. So love, defined in the Bible, starts with God, is expressed within the plans and purposes of God, deals with sin, and transforms people to be in line with the plans and purposes of God. So if you understand love that way, love is all-inclusive, but completely transformative. So love will welcome anyone to the cross of Jesus. No sin is beyond the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. But Jesus, received as he is, will then completely transform you. So is anyone welcome here? Anyone is welcome here. 
Does the love of God then give a tick to any form of behavior? No, the cross of Christ tells us that sin needs to be judged. Will God help us to be changed in Jesus? He definitely will. What's the role of this community? To walk together to make that happen.